What's your name and what year you're in school? And um, I'm Taylor Vashon. I'm a freshman here at UND, and um, currently right now I go to the Creek, which is a non-denominational church. Uh, my name is Allie Staley. I am a junior, um, and then I grew up in a Baptist church, but I now go to Mount Pleasant Christian Church in Greenwood. I'm Maya Campbell. I'm a freshman here, and I go to Columbus first. Hi, I'm Nisi Ross. I'm a senior here. Um, I grew up Pentecostal, but I'm, right now I'm still kind of exploring churches in the area. Hello, I'm Anthony Costello, and I go by Tiger on campus. I am a senior, and I go to Northgate Church in Hammond, which is a non-denominational Christian church. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> So I'm going to ask, uh, can you hear me okay? I'm going to ask a few, uh, few questions if I could get you back up here. And, and, and this conversation can go however you take it. So we're, this is going to be free-flowing. These are all uh, friendly people. They've been paid to uh, behave. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no, there's no, there, there's no and, and you get an A from the class that I'm teaching. Uh, so all of you get an A in the class. So, uh, first question is, what are you aware of as it relates to the United Methodist Church, and what is the United Methodist Church doing? And if you're not aware of anything at all, uh, what would you say about the Christian Church in general? You know, what what are what what does the church do that that that's beneficial to our society? <laughs> you can pass the mic after you speak. <laughs> well, um, I'm not United Methodist, so I'm not 100% aware. Um, a few things that I have been made aware of by um, friends um, would be the decision that was recently made over the summer, um, and also smaller churches that I've attended, um, kind of just aware of the need to reach out to the community. Um, in ways in which they want to reach out, in ways in which they want to be involved, particularly in our generation. And you, you made reference to the decision that was made. Mm. You want to say a word about that or pass the mic along and have others say <laughs> uh, And, and how, how, how do you respond to that? What would you have to say to the church? Mm. Um, well, the decision that was made, um, from what I'm knowledgeable of, was whether or not to um, support the LGBTQ community um, as far as marriage or um, ministers and things of that nature. Um, I believe the decision was to kind of remain with what has been written already as far as marriage um, being between men and women um, and kind of not supporting um, same-sex marriage. Um, how that has impacted me, it's impacted a lot of people around me as far as um, basically not feeling included or not feeling wanted um, in the United Methodist Church. Thank you. Um, so I grew up United Methodist, and I still am, and so I was very involved in the church. And I've been to annual conference, and I did books like a book study on what was going on for the LGBTQ decision. And I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I was quite disappointed with what happened. I think it led to a lot of tension in not only my church, but I think in the denomination as a whole. I think there's a lot of people who, quite frankly, just don't know what's going on right now. But I was also pretty happy with how the youth, I think, stood up. There was a petition that I know at least I signed. Um, J.J. Warren, if any of you know him, he was very vocal. And I think that's really important. And I think it showed that we also have a voice in this fight and that we are disappointed and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Since we got a break, let's give them a hand so far. <laughs> um, like I like they said, we just I just got aware of what the decision was and while I'm not I'm part of the Methodist Church, I am an LGBT individual and it was kind of heartbreaking to know that that they're that as of now that they aren't supportive of it, especially since I do wish to get married and my upbringing is in the church and that's always been a part of me. So, yeah, that's it.
Yeah, so I'm not part of the United Methodist Church either, um, but being involved in a lot of my political science classes, we talk about these current events a lot, and I think it's like, I was also um, kind of disappointed, I guess is the word we're using, but um, I think in our world is like changing a lot, which is obvious, but um, our generation and um, just individuals today are like seeking different things, I guess, and growing up in a Christian background, it's just, um, it's just like a conflict of beliefs, I guess. And so for me, it's just important to make everybody feel welcome, regardless of whether their beliefs agree with yours or not. So it kind of like conflicts with my idea of, I guess, what a church should be, and that a church should be welcoming, and for them to come out, and anyone to come out and say, oh, we don't believe in what you want. I guess it just turns people away, which um, kind of like, I guess, conflicts, like I said, with what the church believes, or what I think the church should do. So, another question. What, what, what is it you need out of a church, any church? What, what should a church represent that you think will be helpful in the shaping of you uh, as good citizens and as, as contributors to society, if, if persons of faith, you've all identified uh, some exposure or, or growing up or currently participating in churches. So, so say, say something about uh, what, do, what do you need out of a church? What, what do you need the church to be and to represent? And how, how, do, how are you contributing to that? Um, yeah, so I think for me, I grew up in a very traditional um, church family. And so coming to college is kind of in a a different experience for me just trying to learn like what what my new faith is or, or kind of I guess adapting that faith that I grew up in and so I think for me a big thing is hypocrisy um, in the church I know that sometimes Christians get this bad rap that you know we're different than non-Christians you know and I think we all have to acknowledge that at some point we were the non-Christians and maybe that was a few days into our life or however um, that has seemed, but I guess just acknowledging that, you know, we're all people and that we all go through these things. And so just being honest with ourselves and being honest with those around us, I think is really something that I find important. Kind of piggybacking off of what she said, I think acknowledging hypocrisy is basically the welcoming invitation that our generation needs. Um, like she said, it is kind of repelling um, to go to a church and kind of be looked down upon, I guess in a sense, as like someone who is maybe a sinner, or even being looked at with a first impression not really knowing who I am or my religious affiliation. So I think just being welcoming, being open, being accepting um, of anyone who walks in the door is really what I would need from a church. So to piggyback, piggyback off what these <laughs> other ladies are saying, definitely that, um, <clears throat> I think my church is really good at that idea of accepting all that, and we are all there for the same purpose. We want to get closer to God, get closer to Jesus, um, and that we aren't all perfect, and that our past doesn't really define us as who we are in our walk with Christ. Um, even my pastor's testimony is that he came from a gang-like background. He kind of showed, like, I can make it here. Like, there's no, no matter where you're coming from, you can always get closer to Christ and go farther than what you ever thought was limited to. So I definitely think the churches need to be able to open their for those who aren't, to open the doors more and kind of show that it doesn't, it's not a defining use because you're getting closer to God. Um, yeah, to, I'm not going to say piggyback more times, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> for me growing up, when my parents got divorced, um, my mom and I bounced around churches a lot and um, she was, I guess left out a lot for being a single mom and I was bullied by my peers at a couple different churches for not going every weekend because my dad he's not religious but he's also not not religious um, so spending time with him on the weekends was important to me um, and it took me a while to finally settle down and I say like fitting in or like building a sense of community which we talk a lot about at chapel plug but um, <laughs> really like that's important because we talk about being individual and unique and not caring what other people think but at the end of the day we all want to find a place where we see ourselves and where to fit in so um, that's what for me is most important in churches can I see myself practicing my faith there um, will I be supported um, can I have a community can I have peers 
um, that really make me like, feel good about myself and that I am supposed to be here, like, in my faith. What does it mean? Uh, how, how would you uh, challenge yourselves and, and all of us here to uh, exercise our faith outside of our churches? So we often think about people coming to a church, but if the church are the people, then we should be the church in the world. Uh, is, that a, is that a challenge for you, or how, how do you wrestle with that or reconcile that? that your, your faith um, outside of a, the four walls of a church. Um, so, like I said, I am an LGBT member. I identify as gay, and for me, part of my faith is kind of just making me slowly develop a close relationship with God. Especially after I came out, it was a process of kind of finding where my relationship with Him is going to go. And for me, for a while, I actually got far from God because the support system I had in my church at the time weren't the best. So it took me to personally kind of pray on it and really work hard for myself to find my relationship with Him. And sometimes it just starts with the faith of a mustard seed of just like, I'm going to try to pray more. I'm actually going to read scripture more. Um, for me, I always try to find, like, once a day, Bible books, and really try to find, like, things that I can hold on to and really try to read into more, discover more of my faith with. So I always try to, like, find something that I can work with. And that slowly developed me to give more into my prayer life, my giving, and my relation with God to where I am much better now comparing to where I started. So I think church outside of the walls has always been something I've kind of struggled with because growing up I had a best friend who was very, very religious and I think in all of our conversations she made me feel like I wasn't religious enough and I wasn't enough. And so I've always just been really wary of how I take my religion outside of my church because I don't want to be pushy and I don't want to seem like I don't accept you for who you are, which is absolutely not true and I think a lot of times especially after all the things happened this summer with the Methodist Church, it was hard for me because I felt like when people heard I was Methodist, they heard, oh, you're not going to accept me. So I think taking my faith outside of the church and letting other people know that you are loved and that you are valued, and just because a denomination may say this doesn't mean that that's what God says or that's what I believe, has been really important for me. I think that's a good time for an applause for <laughs> So when the church is at its best, the United Methodist Church or any church, uh, what does that look like in terms of its impact on the world, society, and even in college campuses? Um, so here at UND, I guess, one of the most impactful things for me was um, moving into college can be difficult anyways, but we have a program here called uh, Threshold. So um, it's, it had like religious um, stuff, but I guess it was helping me find um, people that I could know could relate to me on campus. Um, so just things like that. There, there's also um, a thing over the summer that um, is also for high schoolers, but I, I went the last year I could at Student Leadership Academy. I've heard of that. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was awesome too. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> you and you, so no hounds. Um, but it was things like that where it helps you find people that um, you can relate to. I think is something that's really important. Or small groups, community groups, we call them where you can get in a smaller and like explore your faith deeper with um, peers your own age. Brene Brown, uh, many of you are probably familiar with her work, uh, and her latest work talks about the difference between fitting in and belonging, mm -hmm. and finding a place of belonging. I think on college campuses, it's been a long time since I was a student, but uh, I think that's, uh, and I think you just articulated that when you come in to in your first year, you know, it's, how do you find a places to fit in, and, and is there is an opportunity over the course of several years that you're going to be in a community to find a sense of belonging? And uh, I know that's something I think all humans desire. Uh, you want to comment on any of that, any of the students? I see some heads nodding, so that was the kind of get you started. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. 
I mean, we all need to find our people, you know, and I think um, that goes beyond college and obviously and into jobs and um, into the community that you live in. And I think just being able to articulate your faith and what you believe and how you believe it and surrounding yourself with those people who are like-minded or, or maybe are different-minded and you can kind of either come to a greater understanding yourself or they can come to a greater understanding. I think it's just like kind of back to the whole, just acknowledging that we're all people and that we're all on the same, I guess, starting playing field and so kind of just going from there. I think another thing to help people, especially college students, kind of feel like they belong is that as church leaders, I think you need to acknowledge that a lot of times college students won't feel like they belong at the first couple of weeks of college and so it's really important, especially if they had a strong home church before they came, is to not forget them and not just completely think that, oh, they're going to go off and they're going to find a new church or a new denomination. So they grew up here, but stops here. I think it's really important to keep that relationship really strong. Something, my mom was the youth pastor when I was growing up. She would look at where her students were going to college, and then she would contact the pastors there and say, hey, this is my kid. I, you know, you have them now, but they're always going to be my kid too, and I think we need to share them and we need to support them. And I think that really helps make the transition a lot easier and make you feel like you belong because you have not only that person from college looking out for you, but also your home church still supporting you. Do, do students still get care packages? Is that back from the old days? They do. Huh? They do. They still okay. Right. But to the parent, though, they want to set them. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, a, a scripture passage from Ephesians 4. Uh, verses 2 and 3 from the Common English Bible. Accept each other with love and make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with peace that ties you together. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around unity and disunity, division, uh, both not just in the United Methodist Church, but just uh, both in our political environment, our society environment, our college campuses, there seems to be a great deal of people uh, gathering around their, you know, their own tribe, if you will, whatever that tribe might be. Yeah. Uh, is that something you think threatens us, uh, or how could we, how could we do as the, as the, as the scripture says, accept each other with love and make every effort to preserve the unity with the spirit of peace? Because some of that is not just. Uh, the LGBTQ, but I know uh, about a year ago when I was getting messages around some racial incidents on, di on our different college campuses in our different communities, uh, uh, the, the forgetting of persons who uh, um, in our communities are homeless, turning a blind eye to people who are less fortunate. Uh, the, 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 the quote I read from Francis Asbury, you talked about early on, education. <coughs> was not just for the education of our own children, but to pay attention to those around us who would not possibly have edu access to education. I guess I could point to the president and ask if, you know, if the University of Indianapolis tries to make room for students who may not come from wealthy families and have access to education. That was a long statement. I just got to... <laughs> There's a question in there somewhere. I get excited when I see more than 20 people. I don't know. I don't have a local church. At least me that. I'm supposed to be listening, not talking. All right, help me out here. Um, I would say, for those type of situations, is what I define as something of like a generational cycle. That it's like this. It was taught by this person, so it went to their kids, their kids taught to their kids, and so on and so forth. And those were those kind of issues of peace and unity come from. I think that we're in a really unique spot in time where we are actually having these conversations, kind of bringing up these inconsistencies with faith and with our ideas. Kind of saying, you know, if we're going to show this love, we need to be able to acknowledge our faults. And I think from that, we are definitely able to make greater strains. I think UND definitely has that on campus where we acknowledge when tough times happen that we are still supported and that we're still a unified university no matter what we're affiliated with or where we're coming from and that we stand for the purpose of peace and the unity that we have. So I think it's having a conversation and being able to say that with love we need to make a change because how are we going to be able to show it if we can't even express it? Um, 
I would definitely agree that conversations are very important. I think something that I've kind of noticed is that people are just not okay with being uncomfortable anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we want to always be right. We always want to believe that what we think is what everyone else should think. And so I think that's where unity has stopped. Yeah. Um, pertaining to UND, I would definitely say that they do a good job of um, having difficult conversations, having conversations that are important for everyone to be aware of. Um, and I personally feel comfortable here, even though I'm not United Methodist, even though you know I may be a minority on campus, I still feel comfortable, I still feel like this is a community because they do acknowledge and welcome in um, everyone of all different walks of life. This is your community. You claim this is your community. Yes. So uh, my mom always said, don't talk about two things with friends, religion and politics. Um, <laughs> um, as a political science major, we actually, I'm able to have a conversation with her, like we're saying, um, it's sad to me these days how polarized everybody is, um, whether it's political party, ideological beliefs, religion, like religious, not religious. Um, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that we should all be welcoming, but also thrive off of our differences. So um, it's important for like, like for example, at UND, we have all these things. At the end of the day, we're all students here. We have, but we all have different opportunities that help our individual strengths. Um, come out to the forefront, I guess, and I think um, in regards to church life or religious life, that um, acknowledging the fact that we can all be welcoming and all worship the same God and, and Christ in our own, but it's all in our own, like, different ways. Um, we all come from different backgrounds and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So are, are there any questions or comments from the, from the crowd? They, they have to be consistent with that scripture I read, too. So. Sure. I, I wonder if, um, I'm probably loud enough. Okay. I wonder if you could share, any of you, a time where you actually felt as though the church that you were in heard you, valued you, used your gifts and talents, and you came away from that going, if I weren't here, this wouldn't happen. Uh, I feel extremely valuable and heard. And I'm hoping that at least one of you has a story that you can tell like that. Because I fear that sometimes that's not the case. So I'm just, I'm hoping to hear a story. So, so, a time when you were in the church you're in, or any church, anywhere, where you felt I am a valued contributor to this. I am important here, and they hear me. And this is how I know they hear me. Oh, then I would definitely say my current church right now. Um, okay. Before my current church, I used to go to a lovely church in the East Chicago Monster Region. You may have heard of it, Family Christian Center. Mm -hmm. um, when we left, honestly, because that's where I grew up. That's the church I grew up in. As soon as I was born, I was in the preschool baby holder up until I was in my freshman year of high school. And we switched to my current church, and at first I wasn't used to it. I went from a big mega church to a very small family-based church, and but what God's love definitely affected me that way because I was able to actually grow close to some of the youth, to grow close to the youth pastors. Um, before and I never thought I would be part of like a like men's group or part of like a youth lead ministry and actually be able to lead younger kids to where I am now, where I am part of the leader ministry, I always do help out with like our events when I go home. I still get calls from them even though I'm out here with like, we can't wait to see you again. We like miss you. And I was able to grow a very strong connection with them. And that was just from them just literally having their head, hearts and like souls open to be like, you're not perfect, but we love you. We want to show you this is God's love. This is how much he accepts you. And whenever I have an idea for an event, like let's talk about it. Let's plan it out. Um, I remember one time I just talked to the pastor and passed him like, hey, we should have like a big giveaway for the community. And that turned out to be a big event that we had for the whole month of June a few years back where we gave away just food and clothing and items for free. So I always felt valued because they never saw me as just some like teenager saying things. They were like, let's, let's find the base for us, like grow deep in religion. So I think without them, I don't know where it would be because that 
definitely helped me through some of my darker times when I was in high school and through college because I always had that support system with them. So um, this isn't necessarily about my like home church, but it's more, I would say, the Methodist church as a whole. My junior year of high school, I planned a rally basically for gun control for my entire high school. It was a walkout. And um, I, the, if any of you know Emily Crash, she was for the Emerging Leaders team for INUMC, which I was on, and she really encouraged me to go to annual conference and share my story and share what I did in front of quite a few people, which was not what I was really comfortable with. I'm a very, very shy person. And so I think having her want me to share my story and have all of those people in the audience honestly feel like they were supporting me, I felt like no matter what the Methodist Church may vote, whether it's for LGBTQ or anything else, I know that I do have a voice and it really made me feel valued. Other questions? No, I like to talk. Questions? <laughs> it's a question. So, um, I, um, I don't remember names other than Anthony, because my name's Anthony. There's a question here, Bishop. But So, especially for the, the girls on the left, so I went both to the Creek and uh, Mount uh, Pleasant when I was in here. Do you hear any of these same conversations, LGBTQ, um, from those churches? And if you do or don't, I'm wondering how, how you got connected to those churches. Um, in light of our opening question, impressions of the UMC were all based on the LGBTQ. Um, and I, I love both the churches. I've been to both of them. So I'm glad you're there. Or you can come dusty. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> yeah, so we got a pastor who's a UND uh, uh, alumni. Yeah. Right? Shh, don't, don't tell the annual fund. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get, leave your check before you Um So I'm still currently at the Creek. Um, oh. I did youth groups, um, stuff like that. I would say that I don't remember ever having a truly, like, honest conversation about LGBTQ, um, I think the closest we ever got to any conversation about any, um, what you call it, hot topic or mm -hmm. difficult topics was when we were on a mission trip in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of us, we went, I can't remember what it's called. Um, there's this really big area where there's a lot of um, restaurants and it's a big hall. Um, and for the first time in my life, I was in the minority there. And I think that's the closest we've ever gotten to really um, talking about issues that matter to us, I guess, um, in youth group or even just um, the normal um, church services. Um, okay, so I have not gone to Mount Pleasant for like a very long time, probably about the last year. Um, I grew up in a really small Baptist church, um, and so, I don't know, this is kind of one of my issues with mega churches, I guess. Um, I think sometimes they skirt around um, <laughs> issues <laughs> um, in an effort to, I guess, not step on any toes, and I think that's effective sometimes, but... In short, no, we don't have those kind of discussions. Um, we've had a few like questions on doubts and like like uh, like faith doubts, I guess, but that's probably the most hot topic we've gotten. Thanks. Well, all of you were sitting at the table with me, and we were talking. Um, and Anthony, I think you shared a student organization you're part of, Pride, and many of your peers who had grown up in the church and are no longer feeling connected with the church. Can you just share, because like, that was a really powerful conversation to me, and I, I want to see if you would share that. Okay. Um, well, y'all can hear me, yeah? yeah? Where is Mike? The mic is right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, on campus, I'm part of our LGBTQ group. We call ourselves Pride. And we always have, especially I think last year we kicked it off with having kind of a deep talk about religion and LGBT. Um, and I would say, because beforehand, previous years that I've been here, yes, I've, I've met a few people, but as a whole, from now, I would say out of that, I only met four other LGBT identified people who still practice their faith, whether it be Christian, Catholic, or another type. And when we would have these conversations at Pride, it would very much be a, we never practiced religion, or we did, and then we came out, and then the church, 
in their loving way kicked us out of the church. Uh. One person, individual, expressed their story about how before they came out that they were like part of the youth group and they would lead younger kids when they were in high school. And then I guess one of the younger kids confided in them that they weren't straight. And that person confided to them back like, neither am I, but God so loves you. Until she got called in by her pastor, not the youth pastor, but the actual pastor of the whole church saying, we found out this and we can't let you hang out with the kids anymore as a leader. And that's only became, we don't want you in the church to begin with. And they, that hurt them exponentially because that was their whole growth and that whole, that was a part of them. And for a while they never went back to church. Um, right now this person is kind of going in and out of church trying to find a place where they belong because they missed that kind of belonging. And I'm happy for them truly that they're putting themselves back out there to know and feel God's love. Because that's what I struggled with when I came out was trying to figure out do I give up on something that I know for sure I can't give up? Am I something that is equally important to me and part of my identity? And I know I, me and one other person would always say like, we're, we can tell you now God loves you. He does not care about who you are because at the end of the day you are his child and that's what truly matters. But it is hard because they've been burned so many times. All LGBT people at one point have been burned by a church because they said, it's either we love you and hate your sin or we just flout out, you can't be part of this. Um, and yeah, I've been at that end too. I've prayed, prayed the gay away, I've done books, and I can tell you that's not at all because it caused me more harm, and I doubt God was trying to harm me more than trying to show me that you are who you are and this is my love. So yeah, I know right now we're trying to have that conversation more. I try to invite some of, my, some of the kids like, let's go to church, let me pray for you. And they're like, are you allowed to do that? Is God, is God hear my prayers? I'm like, he hears your prayers. And it's me, I'm thankfully I'm able to give that conversation to them like, you don't have to give this part up along with your faith. Like, you can have both and know that you are completely, completely loved no matter what it is. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. The United Methodist Church is, is still, uh, not only historically, but still today affiliated with the University of Indianapolis, or the University of Indianapolis, which is an independent liberal arts college, is affiliated, is a church-related institution affiliated with the United Methodist Church. What is your message to the United Methodist Church uh, if we are to have a better and long-lasting affiliation with the University of Indianapolis or any other university? Recognizing that it, it never was the intention, I think, in many of these uh, institutions for all people to be a one religion. In fact, you have other religions other than Christianity represented here in student life and, and religious life. So what is your message for a church uh, affiliate, a, a university that's affiliated with the United Methodist Church? What's your message to us as the church? I would say my message is always keep in mind that God's, and this is my opinion, that God's message is to love each other and kind of express that love no matter who you are, what you went through, or how you identify. So at the end of the day, we have our children and that we are to love each other no matter what. Um, my message would be, you know, continue to have an open mind, continue to have an open heart, um, continue to be accepting and willing to listen. Um, I feel like that is really important as you know students come on campus and you know we do have different religious backgrounds we may be unsure we may be unwavering in our faith so being able to you know be that partner that is willing to listen willing to offer support and willing to be there would be um, a definite important thing um, so like I said I, I am Methodist I'm also a religion major so I kind of <coughs> I'm very involved in this and I would think to the Methodist Church, we have to do better. We, yeah. we have people watching, especially like this university there, are watching what we are doing. And I think we have to be conscious of the actions that we are taking and how we are portraying ourselves as Methodists. And we have to start portraying that we are loving and we value every single person. And I think we just have to start being more conscious about that because right now, I don't know, <laughs> we're not, I just don't think we're realizing how many people are seeing the effects of what we are doing, especially colleges like this. 
Um, yeah, I would say I think right now we're just under a lot of a watchful eye, I guess, just from everyone. Everybody's just looking at the Christian community in general, just as like this example, kind of. And then, but they also, I guess, sometimes our influence is stronger than we may realize. And so, kind of what Maya was saying, just like understanding the, the decisions we're making are under a lot of scrutiny. And so, maybe more scrutiny than other decisions. Um, I would say continue to have those conversations, um, difficult ones, easy ones, just to get a sense of what people feel because we can't just ignore things that are happening, like um, the question that um, he brought up about our churches, uh, whether we have those discussions. Um, those are really important. Um, this isn't a real comparison, but like I just I think about it like history major too. So at uh, the Constitutional Convention, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> they they ignored the issue of slavery, um, and then eventually that led to the Civil War. And I'm not saying that's what's happening here. I'm not saying trying to compare it to the um, importance of getting rid of that institution. But if we keep ignoring these conversations because we don't want to step on people's toes, it's gonna end up badly. Um, so continue to have these conversations, not being afraid to talk about these things. That's uh. Brilliant, all of the answers, and, and slavery was is part of the history of our the Methodist denomination too. The, the the early division around those who owned slaves as opposed to those who said that was contrary uh, to Christian belief. So we've been wrestling with these difficult challenges around division and exclusion since the beginning uh, of, of organized religion. So you're, you're spot on. Any words of wisdom for people uh, uh, who are in this crowd around how we might be better citizens and better uh, uh, have a better witness ourselves. Maybe you've already answered that, I don't know, but uh, any, any final words? Uh, we we, we want to give you all one more chance to give a final word of wisdom, uh, all of you, including uh, the middle Campbell, right? The, the future bishop of the Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, often, often folks, older folks, you know, we think we are, we are giving advice and uh, there's something called reverse mentoring that we often are not take, don't take advantage of the mentoring we, we, we can receive. Yeah. So what, any, any counsel you would give us if we want to, we want to be more authentic in our own worship, in our own witness as, as believers. <laughs> um, like it or not, I think the youth are not going away. We are here. And I think as church leaders right now, the best thing you can do is to support us and to help give us a voice because that to me is one of the best ways that you can be a witness to God and to God's love is to help shine that light, not only through you guys, you guys are amazing and awesome, but also through the youth because we have a lot to say. And like I said, we're not going away. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you are youth pastors or maybe you'll have people that are in youth who are going to go through questioning themselves I'd say the biggest thing that definitely helped is show them love don't be so quick to dismiss how they feel especially if they're younger kids because as a kid you're still figuring a lot of other things out so it's nice to just know that sometimes it's good to be heard um, definitely I would encourage if you have that heart for it and that patience to definitely help them encourage how to stay in their faith, whether it be through scripture, looking at other sources online. Um, I know it was damaging for me when I was kind of, especially at a young age, thrown the conversion books. I remember one that was more mature than for my liking, but I couldn't even finish it. And it's just, it hurts to feel like you, someone that you trust says some, you feel something to them that's, so, you tell them something so personal and then they kind of dismiss it or to try to be like, you're broken. Like, that's especially a big thing that I would hear from time to time from um, people. So definitely just show them God's love and help them explore this part of themselves before throwing them into a fire and then letting them be on their own. I would just definitely say um, listening and empathy are two big things for me. Um, growing up, I was unfortunately that kid in the church that was kind of, my problems were kind of minimized. 
and like, oh, you're just a kid, oh, you'll be fine, you know, things like that, they weren't taken very seriously for me. Um, I didn't feel like I was listened to, I didn't feel like, you know, as the listener or the preacher or the minister, you know, they were kind of empathizing with me because, I mean, you guys were once young too, you know, you kind of experienced the things that we have experienced. And I think that's something that has been lost. So I would definitely say yeah, listening and empathy, um, showing your love, showing your support um, are big things. Um, uh, for me, one of the most important things at my church was uh, uh, opportunities for student leadership. So you talk about learning from younger people. I got the opportunity last year to lead a small group of first graders. And kids, they say a lot of things. They don't have a filter. Like, yeah, filter. They're not afraid to just like, <laughs> Sometimes they can say the silliest things, but sometimes they really, like, you know, say stuff. And for me to be in that position helped me grow in my faith so much more. And so opportunities for students to be involved in the church. Like, we have an internship program at our church for high schoolers. We have um, stuff they can help out, and it's called Cadastrial Park with um, younger kids. Um, we even have a college-age ministry where they help volunteer during services. It's something that I think will really help um, in different churches for students. So, God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah in the 33rd chapter and says, I love you with an everlasting love. And so I want to say that these University of Indianapolis outstanding scholars and students, God loves you with an everlasting love. And so do we, and we want to thank you for this, uh, this opportunity to be in conversation with you. Can we thank our students? off now from WWE. <laughs> God bless you. I don't know why, uh, Elise, you want to come forward. So we greatly appreciate you. You are awesome and fantastic. Thank you so much. And so as listeners, um, it's all good to say, oh, that was cute. They were cute. They, that's not cute. So the question that I offer to you all around the tables for just a few moments, what did you hear? And what will you take back? to be a different, to make a difference. Yeah. What did you hear and what will you take back? Because it's good to hear young people, but we want to hear, we want them to know that we are listening and there's a difference. So what did you hear? And what will you take back to your churches if you're a pastor? Or what will you take back if you're laypersons? What, what will be different because you've listened? That's the conversation I would like for you to have. Five minutes around your table. Thank you. 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 Thank you.